About 10 years ago, it was over 10 years ago now, I was an undergraduate at Yale University, majoring in Jewish studies. Uh, they called it Judaic studies, but again, we can haggle about the terminology of Jewish, Judaic, Hebrew, and Jewish cultural studies at the University of Michigan. As a major in this department, they had a limited number of faculty, but they often brought in guest faculty. And in the course catalog for a particular semester, there was a class entitled The Jews of Spain. And I thought, that sounds interesting. I went to the class, and it turns out that we had the person who wrote the book on it. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> the Jews of Spain by Jane Gerber. But what I found in the class was not just a marvelous exploration of the topic, someone who is an expert in the field, but also a wonderfully bright and insightful and kind and generous person with whom I found a very personal connection. And it's been a special pleasure to work with her not only in that class so many years ago, but also to be able to bring her back to the Institute to teach in our rabbinic and leadership program seminars, and to be a part in some way of the ongoing mission of the Institute. Now just to give you one idea of how important she is in the field of Sephardic studies. You remember that 1992 is the 500 year anniversary of the expulsion from Spain. But Jane was very instrumental in, involve, in involving a particular family in a special event. One of the most famous figures out of this Sephardic diaspora that left Spain was the Abarbanel family. And this family had a family reunion 500 years later. And Jane was instrumental in putting it together. The, the patriarch of the family, so to speak, who was instrumental in contacting the family, lives in Portland and part of the Sephardic community that's out there. But Jane was the glue that helped put it together. And in fact, in our class at Yale University was a Karen Abravanel who came from that family and was at that reunion in 1992. So if you want someone who's intimately part of the world of this stage and period in Jewish history, we have her here in Jane Gerber. Please welcome Jane Gerber. I don't have to tell you because I'm sure you know that Adam got an A for the course. <laughs> <laughs> it is, <laughs> I don't think Yale allowed A pluses, but he would have gotten an A plus. That it is Saturday morning, it is Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> I heard something, unless I misheard it, last evening that I've been mulling over in an insomniac way since then. And I'm quoting, the heart of Judaism, this was a quote from Sherwin, the heart of Judaism is not a book. I have a feeling, having met Sherwin and really sensed some of his charisma, that he knew that today in synagogues, we would be discussing Lech Lecha, that is the portion of the Torah of Abraham's, the promise that God made to Abraham of the seeds from the seeds of his two children, Isaac and Ishmael. And it is a very, very uh, resonant, a very critical, central concept of our dialogue as Jews, as Muslims, Jews with the Muslim world, that we understand that ambiguous, shared, fought over, um, cherished, and in some ways compelling and also demanding tradition about our own separate integrities as people and what the flow and the needs are from those integrities, and they come from a book. So I just begin, since it is the Shabbat in which we would be reading or discovering or talking about some of the insights of the wanderings of Abraham uh, as we begin. Now, I, have, I also have this sense, so I'll confess it in public, that I, in some ways, walked into a lion's den because a medievalist, particularly a, a, someone in medieval Jewish history, is and then a, a medieval Jewish history of the Jews under Islam, which is noch besser, <laughs> seemed to require taking 
a stand. You're either on this side or you're on that side. You're either a hawk or you're a dove. You're either right or you're left. And depending upon the day, depending upon the news, depending upon the audience, that was the way in which the handful, and certainly in the United States, of my colleagues in this field seem to fashion their remarks. I'm gonna to try to do otherwise to you, but I want you to understand from the outset both the nature of the Jewish appraisal today, or the appraisal today of the past, and the variety of sources that create a picture that is quite complex. We're all saying over the weekend the word nuance, but nuance here is also really what is involved. In 1948, there were approximately one million Jews living in the Muslim world. And today, there are approximately 30,000 Jews living in the Muslim world. They are currently, I just give you this data for, uh, just for data to put in your data bank, there are approximately 3,000 Jews remaining in Morocco, about 15,000 and diminishing in Turkey, and about 18,000, but you can't really get a very accurate count for many reasons, uh, Jews in Iran. In Egypt, at last count, there were nine Jews remaining. In Afghanistan, one, and fewer than a handful or none in the rest of the Muslim countries. I bring this up because it will give you a sense that for the first time in history, something very, very new has happened. The Jews of Muslim lands were Jews not only deeply rooted in their historic countries, but that longevity had created a shared culture and a shared familiarity and a reflexive kind of give and take so that living together or coexisting was part of not just the landscape but of the reality of their lives over the millennia. And now for the first time one can speak or generalize, if you can do that, of the phenomenon of the Mizrahi Jew, of the Middle Eastern Jew, or the Sephardi Mizrahi, however we want to call it, which is a separate issue, as the really as a past tense, as the phenomenon of the past, which ordinarily would mean once something is past that you can then begin to discuss it with a certain amount of dispassion. By the way, can you hear? Is it yes? Okay. But that is really not the case since as the past was beginning, as the end was unfolding, there was already selective recall, there was already pain, there was already nostalgia, politicizing, romanticization, lapsed memory, and innocent or intentional distortions. So that, in fact, the adage that history is what one age finds worthy of note in another does apply quite well to the current situation on trying to interpret this history. Coexistence has today another term that's often used. By coexistence we mean literally coexisting, parallel societies, side by side, living in the same landscape sometimes living it with a joint, very clear apprehension of each other's holidays and what that required in the best as well as the negative sense. Coexistence for the Spaniards had a phrase coined, convivencia, convivencia, the living with, the living together. And the Spaniards for both commercial and ideological and other reasons, other reasons which I'll explain in a moment, uh, turn that around, particularly in the last, um, in the recent past, 
So that what had been a philological term, just a word coined by a philologist to talk about Muslims, Christians, and Jews living together in Spain, became synonymous or implied harmony, coexistence, mutual fructification, and mutual benefit. So there you have um, this overlay in which there is certainly now in the West a sense that our past together was a past that was often harmonious. And I see my task this morning in the bit of time allotted to me to try to break down a little bit, or rather to give you a schematic view, so that we get a sense of how do we balance, how do we evaluate, and what kinds of conclusions or questions can we ask from that past. Precisely because of the scope of this shared history, there are certain dangers. Number one, as we know, Americans are abysmally ignorant about the world of Islam. And in this huge geographic canvas, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean, from Morocco, which was a society with its own unique history, not having been conquered by the Ottomans, and therefore expressing much more of the native, the mystical, the Berber aspects of its culture. Therefore, it's Jews also expressing a Moroccan jewelry and a Moroccan persona. All the way across the empires of the Middle East stretch, or the, of Islam, all the way, as we know, past Iran into uh, the Indian area. And this vastness means that, number one, we are dealing with more than one Islam, more than one people or national group, more than one culture. And the Jewries who lived for 1,500 years had local histories that are colored, not just in cuisine, not just in language, so that you have Judeo-Persian, you have Judeo-Tat, you have Judeo-Marathi, Judeo-Arabic, but they're also colored in their own conceptions and memories of their coexistence. Now, to add to our difficulty about generalizing, we know that we do have two camps today among scholars and to a lesser extent, the journalists only have one camp, so I leave the journalists out of this, but among scholars as to the quality of Jewish life in Muslim lands. And both, if we, re one of those camps is those based on eyewitness accounts, based not on ex post facto hearsay, but on hundreds of centuries of data from the Jewish community. Mm. Let me give you an example of data that is used by Jewish scholars to know how a Jew the Jews lived. When I was uh, doing my research on 16th century Morocco, and the Jews of Morocco who had come out of Spain, and how did they reconstitute their lives in North Africa. I could, and I did, recognize and celebrate the fact that the kingdom of Fez and the king of Fez, the Jews say in the Chronicles, Melech Hasid Haya. That was the way, he was a righteous king. That was the way for the Jews, when they talk about a righteous king, it meant someone who either didn't slam the door on them or kick them out. But the king of Fez not only didn't slam the door and kick them out, but he let them congregate outside the city for, in the quarantine for about two years until they were brought into the city. And so about 10,000 refugees from Spain found refuge in Morocco. The same Jewish source tells us, or a different Jewish source, which is a communal record book that has the conditions and the terms of apprenticeships 
you're hiring or you, you're undertaking to teach a young man a craft. And it was usually young men because the young women would do weaving in the house, but they generally did domestic kinds of occupations that were significant, by the way. They were allowed to keep their savings or, or their earnings. In the, and sometimes this was put in their ketubah. So even that, the, the status of women is, is different from what we think about so-called world of Islam in pre-modern times. But there were contracts that at first I couldn't understand. The contracts said, I am going to undertake to bring an eight or nine year old boy into my um, office or my workshop, my little atelier, and teach him the craft of silversmith or some kind of smithing. And then he's going to go out to the countryside to sell the artifact that he had made. I will let him have an hour a day off to pray and an hour a day off to study in the little cheder, well, it wasn't a cheder, they are kutab, in the little school for, in the Jewish community. And I will provide for him twice a year a, a new pair of shoes. And the shoes will be the following. One shoe will be a sandal of straw of one color, and one shoe will be a sandal of leather of a different color. Now, why did they do that? Well, this was part of the detail of going out into the countryside that made the Jew distinguishable, the distinguishing signs that marked the Jew off. In the year 1825, a young English scholar by the name of Edward Lane was diagnosed with a mild case of TB, then commonly known as consumption. And so Lane abandoned the calling that his father had destined him for, which was the clergy, of course, I guess most learned kids that showed an aptitude for, for studies would go into the clergy. And he set off for Egypt and began his lifelong study of the Arabic language and Arabic civilization. We have a surviving photo of him. He'd gone native. He had the turban, a big mustache. He married a local girl. And he was very much, his, the pictures are very, very typical of a 19th century European romantic going native in the Middle East. Lane was, wrote two enormously popular books, a travel book in 1836, called The Manners and Customs of Modern Egyptians, and a multi-volume English translation of The Thousand and One Nights, The Arabian Nights. He, from 1848 until his death in 1876, he published a translation of excerpts from the Quran and was absorbed for decades in putting together an Arabic thesaurus and monumental Arabic-English dictionary, which is still a reference that, that you must use today. This work I mention um, to you, his, it was published po posthumously by his nephew to show you that this was a man who really was immersed in the local scene and the local culture. He wasn't the sensational uh, sightseer who would come through the Near East to find the exotic. And he writes the following in 1836. The Jews of Egypt are under a less oppres oppressive government than any other country of the Turkish Empire. Still, he observed, not long ago, they used to be jostled in the streets of Cairo and sometimes beaten merely for passing on the right of a Muslim. At present, they are less oppressed, but still they scarcely ever dare to utter a word of abuse when reviled or beaten unjustly by the meanest Arab or Turk. For many a Jew has been put to death upon a false and malicious accusation of uttering disrespectful words against the Quran or the Prophet. 
It is common to hear an Arab abuse his jaded ass and after applying to him various opprobrious epithets, end by calling the beast a Jew. We have a second account. There are literally hundreds of them, but I bring a second one, not, by the way, to be inflammatory. I just want to illustrate to you the dilemma and then try to solve a little of it. This is an account from the 1880s from Iran, again by a, a traveler, who said at every public festival, even at the royal salam before the king's face, the Jews are collected, and a number of them are flung into the house or tank, that king and mob may be amused by seeing them call, crawl out, half drowned and covered with mud. The same kindly ceremony is witnessed whenever a provincial governor holds high festival. There are fireworks and Jews. Perhaps the bleakest appraisal was that of the 12th century magisterial scholar, Moses Maimonides, who obviously was not writing in a neutral atmosphere since he himself was exiled three times within Mus the Muslim world, first from Spain, within Spain, from Cordova to um, within Spain elsewhere, wandering for about 12 years, then from Spain fleeing to Morocco, then from Morocco fleeing to Egypt. And he, because of a fundament, a wave of fu Muslim fundamentalism that struck that part of the world in the mid 12th century. And he said, a quote, which I give you because it is used quite often, and you, my brethren, know that on account, of our, on account of our many sins, God has hurled us amidst this nation of hostile Ishmael. Never has a nation risen more injurious to us than this people. No nation has been so intent on humiliating us and degrading us. The key word within that quote is the humiliation and degradation. Because, in fact, the unfolding of a status, the defining of the status of the Jew, was based upon the notion of protection or dhimma and dhimma or protection had or carried within it certain understandings about what this bargain was all about. We will protect you, we expect in return certain limiting or self-limiting or our limiting uh, notions of on your behavior. Now, in contrast, before explaining what that was and when it unfolded, let me just explain to you the, the golden age notion of a, a, a time of great harmony, of uh, great cooperation, mutual enrichment or enrichment of the minorities in the majority culture, also comes uh, before us, it can be thrown before us, to question well, what is all that about humiliation? Well, the notion comes out of the 19th century, and it is, in fact, a notion, the toleration of Islam towards the Jews, that the founders of the study of scientific Judaism presented to the world. This, I, I chose two different analysts to just to give you a quote or two, to give you the flavor to understand what was going on in their world and their minds. The two I've chosen were not incidental figures. They were giants of Jewish learning and pioneers of historical and philological studies. One you know by name, if you don't know his work, Heinrich Gretz, Gretz was the really great historian of the Jews of the 19th century, whose figures that he chose to write about 
were larger than life and he breathed such drama into them that he was beloved. There was a time when all Jewish households had a copy of Gress's multi-volume history of the Jews. Um, I was surprised after my father died. We had two, two uh, different copies of the multi-volume. Somewhere, I mean, someone must, must have been a gift, but you, you just didn't throw out Gretz, even if it was the 19th century thing, because it still, in some ways, is among the most dramatic portraits and cameos of, um, of the Jews. And the second, he was dazzled, by the way. Gretz, and this is a question here, we have the problem of selecting. Gretz was dazzled by the culturing, cultural flowering that he saw in Spain. And not just in Spain, but there was a particular moment of meeting that changed the Jewish people forever. And that particular moment took place partly in Medina de Zahra, in <coughs> the magnificent courts and palaces and perfume <coughs> gardens and tiled landscapes or patios of the King Abdurrahman III with a Jewish courtier doctor. And the courtier doctor having in his entourage a pair of competing poets began a process that really revolutionized Jewish knowledge. Now, what happened there? What was Gretz seeing from the outside that then he called the golden age of Spain? What he was seeing, which existed, was in fact the Jew, the protected Jew, the Jew who was supposed to know his place and keep his place, the Jew heard what one heard very, very uh, casually, and that was that the proof, one of the proofs of the truth of Islam was in the Quran, in the beauty of the Arabic language, and everybody, which is indeed the case, the beauty of the Arabic language in the Quran, and everybody knows that God in paradise speaks in Arabic. It's the language of God. Well, every Jew knows. <laughs> Maybe even there, Adam up there. Every Jew knows that the God that doesn't exist <laughs> speaks in paradise in Hebrew. <laughs> and if in his formal moments, in his informal moments, it might be Judeo-Arabic. It must be Yiddish as well, <laughs> and maybe Ladino. But the Jews began in this atmosphere of the, both the love of language, the study of language, the immersion in ph philology, the need as well, and it was competitive, creative competition to prove how nimble, how subtle, how gorgeous Hebrew was, biblical Hebrew. If It's all the better if you could write a poem that had 20 biblical allusions in it. Or you write a poem, you had to show through these verbal pyrotechnics that you could write a poem with every line having the letter resh or R in it, every word. Or a poem where every word was without the letter R and a poem or a limerick that could be understood backwards as well as forwards that had meaning. All of these were literally the kinds of tricks going on in the salons of um, both Spain, and not only Spain, but also in Kairouan in North Africa. A brought in the packet of the merchant who came on the caravan with the Muslims, in the ships with the Muslims, and leaving the poems in Cairo, in the repository known as the Cairo Geniza. So there was a period of time, a window of time, of about 150, 200 years, in which 
a golden class sang in Hebrew with the songs, with the tunes, with the motifs, and the rhythms and rhymes of the Arabs. That was the golden age. Now, the, the Jews of Europe needed in the 19th century, the, the Jews who were arguing about equality, emancipation, give us rights, were compelled, and they were arguing this very, very passionately in the parliaments of Europe. Gretz was only one, Steinschneider was another, Leo, Leopold Suntz was another. These were all founders of the scientific study of Judaism. They tried to show, or they were compelled to show, that if you gave Jews rights, they could be reformed, they could be changed, they could be made worthy, quote unquote, of emancipation, they could be improved. The word improved was also used. And the way to show this, it was even better if you could show, and this is the ultimate apologetics of all people, you show how much you contribute to society. If you look, by the way, at the Jewish bo books written here in the 1940s in America during the Holocaust, and the, the, the Jews themselves were so insecure, Jewish contributions to civilization, that was one. Who wrote, who was a Jew? Who was, that was when all the, the Columbus is a Jew um, started. The, this was to show that you were deserving, you were worthy. If you were given rights, you'd contribute. It's an apology. It's an apology for yourself. And it was even better if you could find an example from Europe. So the cult of Spain began at that time as far as Jews were concerned. Now, what does that leave us with? It leaves us with the two schools today that we have. Those who, seeing the very, very, very um, depressing examples of a downtrodden, of a persecuted, of a harassed, not persecuted in the sense of pogrom after pogrom in the European mold, but harassed and minor local pogroms, which of course, if you're the victim, it's, you're still the victim, whether it's local or, or, or continental. And the, on the other hand, that theoretical literature as, that was invented or heralded in the 19th century, trumpeted in the 19th century, of the golden age. Judaism, and here, look, Gret says, Judaism ever strove towards the light. Thus, in the 10th century, there was only one country that offered suitable soil for the development of Judaism, where it could blossom and flourish. It was Mohammedan Spain. Of course, they spoke in the Mohammedan terms and not understanding the, the intent of that either. Novelists took that up. Washington Irving in his Tales of Alhambra, for, for example. Benjamin Disraeli took up this um, theme as well. And we have the young Disraeli rhapsodizing about Muslim Spain as the following. That fair and unrivaled civilization in which the children of Ishmael rewarded the children of Israel with equal rights and privileges with themselves. During these halcyon centuries, says Disraeli, or Konigsby, his character, it is difficult to distinguish the followers of Moses from the votary of Muhammad. Both alike built palaces, gardens, and fountains. Both filled equally the highest offices of state. That's an absurd exaggeration. <laughs> Competed in an extensive and enlightened commerce, rivaled each other in renowned universities. Another absurd ex exaggeration. But he wanted, obviously wanted the Jews to be able to get into a university in Europe. So this was a good argument. Now, what are we left with? And that is, in the long course of Jewish life in Muslim lands, for the sake of convenience, I think it's, I'll give you a tiny schema and then stop for a moment or two at one of those eras. The schema would be 
within this 1400 year encounter, and by the way, it's grossly oversimplified, so I apologize for those of you who, who know this history in any detail. There is the first very critical foundation period that Professor Lassner explained, the meeting of the prophet in the oasis of Medina, where there were about 20 Jewish clans and three major tribes with whom Muhammad had verbal and physical encounters. And these encounters, in the heat of um, the religious arguments, these encounters, echoes of these encounters, are preserved in the Quran. And as you heard, the fact that they are preserved in the Holy Scripture gives them a special both authority and problematic quality. There was also, which he didn't tell you, there were, pres there were practical precedents that are equally ambiguous or threatening from that first period. One, Muhammad, one of the major tribes, Muhammad subjected to a heavy tax. The second of the major tribes, Muhammad uh, ousted from Medina, exiled from Medina to an oasis far away. And the third tribe, he beheaded all the males and enslaved the uh, women and children. So you'll have three precedents even there that are precedents from the prophet himself uh, within the earliest tradition. Now, the second period, and Muhammad's career was uh, very, very, it was, it was cut short. It was short, it was like any um, religious founder, the critical stage of the movement is often, is naturally also the working out of the religious society after that charismatic figure is gone. And this, obviously, we, we sense parallels here um, in our meetings uh, and in your reunions uh, in, in Birmingham Temple. Now, the second phase of this sort of six part, you could make it 10 parts, I'm not gonna do that. But um, the second phase is the phase of the conquest of Islam. And the pragmatism of the warriors who were confronted by a, their conquests, some of which were lightning conquests, some of which were more difficult. And in either event, they, there were precedents that were established. If a people that they were invading surrendered, or if they had to fight the people, there were different precedents and different terms. And in fact, they were these, the, the Arab warriors who were the vanguard of the conquerors were very interested in pushing, pushing, pushing forward the uh, lucre, the booty, the rewards from the conquest were, had a formula for division. And since the native peoples in the conquered lands, in the case of the native people in the conquered lands, who were monotheists, they were left either as administrators, utilized as administrators, provided the talents as well to be the urban population, and there was the necessity of devising a mode of living with and administering these people. This period of about 200 years is from the point of view of Jewish history among the most silent. We do not know very much about the period of the conquest. We know we have a few, but very few accounts about it, but by inference, by comparison with the terms of the treaties of surrender with the Christian populations, and by looking retro, retrospectively at this so-called pact that begins to evolve 
we know that Jews, as protected people, had a certain bargain that was struck. Now, let me, before I just give you a few of its stipulations, let me simply say that one of the most fortunate things, or one of the distinguishing things, if we look at Islam and the Jews, or Christianity and the Jews, is that the theory of the place of the Jews under Islam was not all that bad in comparison to Europe, to Christendom. And the theory was often not applied in practice. Parts of it were, parts of it weren't. So as bad as the theory was, it wasn't always applied. In Christendom, the practice tended to be worse than the theory. If the theory was to preserve the Jews as witness to the truth of Christianity, still you didn't have to preserve them everywhere, nor all the time, nor, and what preservation meant uh, was something very, it was up for grabs. Now, the, the pact, the protection, was uh, something where the protected person was known as a dhimmi, D-H-I-M-M-I. His condition, or her condition, was that which you could call dhimmitude. And this status was worked out by jurists, slowly in response to what to do with all these Christians and, and Jews. New cities are sprouting up, and here, let me just indicate with a few of the stipulations how it was or wasn't <coughs> obeyed. There were several areas of vimitude. Do I have an admin or yep. a timer, timekeeper? 10 minutes Perfect. to just work that? Okay. The theory was that there were areas. The underlying, premise was that protection was not unconditional. Nor was toleration, as you heard, anything like what a contemporary person would define as toleration. It was obviously something you've heard much more about as being um, it, a, a very, in a very different mold. Acceptance of the contract meant adherence to a subordinate status a second-class status. Which, by the way, from the point of view of the Jews, wasn't something alarmingly new. For the Christians, it was. And so by, by the medieval, medieval times, there you had, had either mass conversions of Christians to Islam, mass exodus from the world of Islam, so that in parts of, say, like in North Africa, when the sources talk about Ahl al or the Dhimmi, they're really only talking, that's equivalent to talking about the Jew. There was nobody else but the Jew still around at that time, in, you know, after a few centuries. The arrangement for the Jew also meant, well, we are going to get protection and we will abide in turn by certain forms of discrimination. The arrangement was pragmatic. It wasn't always obeyed, but there were several areas of life that I should mention to you. Initially, subjects were expected to provide various services to the conqueror. That's normal among all peoples. Conquered peoples take food, they take housing, they ask for the American Revolution it had to do with quartering British troops. It's a humiliation that is part of um, being a subjected people. Soon, a set of discriminatory or distinguishing features that quote-unquote protected peoples were expected to obey were added. This meant special headgear, clothes of a, of a, of a particular color, red for uh, Samaritans, blue for Christians, yellow for Jews, yellow badge later on in Europe. The yellow is synonymous with Jew, comes from the Pact of Umar. The, sometimes the regulations became absurd or extreme or outrageous, but that was unusual. Even the extreme ones give us a sense of what the intention was. For instance, 
in the 11th century in Egypt, that's the height of the good times, we're told the Jews had to wear like a neck band or a bell around them. So if they went into the hammam, into the bath, the public bath, they, you wouldn't be mistaken. A Muslim and a Jew wouldn't be mistaken. You'd still be set off, even in, in, in the raw, so to speak. The Jews and Christians worship was to be a modest affair, such as a synagogue couldn't be higher than a mosque. It should be inconspicuous and inoffensive. No loud church bells um, or the sounding of the shofar. The, what's interesting is that the church, we, we think of when you go to Israel, um, the sound of the muzin, the sound of the church bells, the sound of Jerusalem being of many, uh, many forms of worship, that's a relatively new phenomenon. It wasn't until the British ambassador Finn, using, flexing the muscles of the, uh, of the British Empire, actually had the church bells reintroduced in the 19th century in the Holy Sepulchre. So it, the n notion of being inconspicuous was real. Muslims um, shouldn't, Jews shouldn't engage in public, any kind of public display or processional. This was a hardship. Middle Eastern Jews are very demonstrative at funerals. And I know when I've done teacher training with teachers in Brooklyn who uh, work in Flappish Yeshiva, which now has a lot of children from Middle Eastern communities, or in North Shore on the island, Hebrew Academy, which is mostly Persian, they tell me when the classmates go to a funeral, the kids, the Ashkenazi kids are shocked. The women are crying. They are jumping on the on the uh, on the um, coffin. The the sense of demonstrating and expressing your emotion openly was something in in a Muslim city. A Jew did not do that in processional to the cemetery, which is a little hard because the cemetery had to be outside the walls. A Jew. One of the intentions of these uh, laws was to distinguish the Jews. The other was to humiliate them. And humiliation could take very specific forms. In Iran, for instance, one reason, by the way, the Jews were so excited when the um, dynasty, Pahavi dynasty, fell and the Shah disappeared was not because of the love of the Shah, but the Pahlavis had ended the discriminatory regulations, which had included the following. A Jew can't go out in the rain because he pollutes the rain. He'll pollute the water. A Jew can't, um, in, the, in the marketplace, and of course they were all, most of them petty merchants in the bazaars, his head should be lower than the countertop. There shouldn't be eye contact between a Jew and a Muslim. The Ladino press in New York tells us following of the awe of the Sephardic women on the Lower East Side. Yes, there were Sephardic women on the Lower East Side. And those, uh, that immigration of Sephardic women, they were in awe of the Ashkenazi women who go into a store and press all the fruit to see if it's fresh. You know what you do with the tomatoes. <laughs> well, if a Jew touched it in the Ottoman Empire, and here they were all coming from Turkey and from you know, Izmir and, and elsewhere, it was, it was unheard of. In fact, also the men did the shopping, which wasn't such a bad setup. <laughs> <laughs> the Jews, the Jewish women in Iran from, in these Qajar regulations, the Jewish women could not wear a veil outside when all the other women had to wear a veil outside. And on and on we could go with these. One of the things in, in pointing these out to you is to show you, obviously, the specificity is local. The intention, sometimes these were implemented, sometimes they weren't. But the psychological damage and the psychological adjustment or accommodation was real. Now, what in some, though, was the good part of the bargain? I like to talk about the four freedoms not of Woodrow Wilson, 
but the four freedoms of the Pact of Umar. There was in it, which for the Jew is the bottom line, you had freedom of religion and control over one's own affairs. Jewish autonomy, the ability to live as a Jew in your home and a Jew in your little quarter, and not be, first of all, the only alien. You were in multi-ethnic societies, whatever we want to call them. It's not modern multiculturalism, but the Jew was not the only stranger. And he was not engaged in occupations that were either despised, were labeled as the work of the devil. No, the opposite. Muhammad had been a merchant. It was meritorious to be a merchant. The, so the, the freedom of religion and freedom of economic endeavor with restrictions were, in fact, very real pluses. There was also freedom of movement, unlike Europe. And this freedom of movement, uh, in Arabic they would say, feel haraka baraka. In, in travel, in movement, there's blessing. You went, you went to study on the other part of it, all around the world. Jews did that too, just as Arabs did it, Jews did it, to go sit at the feet of, the, of a scholar, except the, the Arabian Peninsula. I think Kissinger was the first one to break the barrier of, of going into the Arabian Peninsula. By and large, there was also freedom of domicile. It is common and was common in Middle Eastern cities for different clans, different occupations, different tribes, different peoples to live in their own en enclaves, but ne not solely in their own enclaves. There could be others. So Jews lived uh, almost anywhere. And the ghetto existed, but as a late, um, late-ish. 15th century, the ghettos begin in North Africa, compulsory ghettos. Prior to that, you didn't have that. And there was, of course, a, a large exception, and that was the exception to a long, long time or long period of decline of a burst of creativity and freedom in the 1600s, again, in the Ottoman Empire for about 100 years, 16th century. So the working out of the pact worked out a bargain that was livable for its time and its place. It was not livable for a 20th century person um, with notions of, you know, of modernity, of, free, of freedom of enterprise and freedom of expression. The, well, how do we evaluate then in conclusion what, uh, what to say about this 100-year brilliant, sparkling episode in philosophy, 150 years, in science, in translations, in interculture, in great cultural innovation. Centuries of decline and to a certain degree of degradation. Humi One thing that I would say is that humiliating conditions that were imposed on the Jews for over a thousand years by Muslim rulers were predominantly social and economic, not religious. And that might sound strange to your ears or my ears living in this time, but from the point of view of Jewish survival, which is, could, never, could not be gainsaid in Europe, it wasn't so bad if you, you could live with scorn, provided you were allowed to live. At the same time, we shouldn't underestimate the psychological toll of this bargain, of keeping a low profile and having conditional acceptance. If you rose too high, yes, there was a Shmuel Hanagid, a Samuel Ibn Negrela. Yes, the very fact that he rose so high in the state in Spain meant that 10 years later, there was a pogrom in which 4,000 Jews were murdered in, in uh, Granada. And the slogans were that the Jews had violated the Pact of Umar. That was the reason that was given. The king should not, the religious reformers came in and said, the king should remember, the Jews have to keep their place. 
So that the historic precedents then were ones that were quite fascinating. Perhaps the Limi partnership worked better for the Jews than for the Christians, partially since their historic legacy had always provided an ideology that their suffering at the hands of foreign powers had meaning and was ultimately the product of their own guilt. Because of our sins, we are exiled. That they used to say several times a day. Jewish history had inured the Jews to trials and hardships and had schooled them in the art of accommodating to cynical, to ruthless powers, or to demeaning conditions with tact and resignation. At the same time, their tradition had held out promise of ultimate redemption and return to national wholeness and of an end to that very humiliation, which they fervently prayed for at every opportunity and every day. And so this ambiguous but continuous, bittersweet, sometimes enriching, much of the time degrading relationship continued from 622, the initial hijra, the emigration of the Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Medina, until about 1948, 1950, 1956. Thank you. Thank you.